It's the one thing that we all have, the mind, right? But it's the one thing that we don't have a manual for. We buy a blender, we get a manual. Our iPhone comes with a manual. We get a car, and it has a manual. Nobody teaches you how to use the mind. There's no manual for the mind. So this, I think, is one of the most essential things in making progress in our life, is really understanding how our mind works. It's the one thing that we have to live with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have no choice. Imagine if you were, if most of you were slept eight hours a day, which most of you don't. Uh, you slept and you were awake 16 hours a day. In the 16 hours you practice your awareness just randomly moving from one thing to another, to another, to another, all day practice being distracted. What would you be good at after six months? You did the 16 hours a day, you just allow your awareness to jump from one thing to another to another. I'll tweet right now, I'll switch to text messaging, then I'll go to email, all oh, my phone's ringing, so I'll answer the phone. And then somebody's speaking to me, so I'll have two conversations at one time. And I'll just do this, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. So you get it being good at distracted. After one year, you're an expert at being distracted. After a year and a half, they'll invite you to give keynote talks on being distracted. <laughs> you're so good, you practice 16 hours a day. So the same works for the opposite. If you practice being concentrated 16 hours a day, what would you become good at? You become good at concentrating. And all it takes is, being, is practice by just doing one thing at a time, keeping your awareness on one thing at a time. And you integrate this into everything that you do in your life. So the best way to do it is pick a few opportunities in your everyday life. For example, we all speak with people. When I speak with somebody, I give them my undivided attention. I keep my awareness on them. And the conversation is really brief. Why? Because we're concentrated. We're not being distracted. A 10 minute conversation normally just takes three minutes because you're just so focused. I define concentration as the ability to keep that awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. So if I can keep my awareness on Eric and not drift away and think about the wedding or drift away and think about the vacation or what I'm going to do later, then I'm concentrating on Eric. Every time it drifts away, I bring it back. And the more I practice this, the more I practice concentration. So concentration is the ability to keep your awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. And that's a very simple definition of concentration. How do you get better at concentration? You practice this. You practice this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's the only way to get good at it. And what's the best way to practice it? The best way to practice it is to integrate it into everything that you do in your life. Not to meditate 10 minutes in the morning. It doesn't work. You really need to look at your life the same way a sprinter in the Olympics looks at his life. You've all heard of Usain Bolt, the man that won the gold medal twice, two Olympics in a row, broke the world record. I don't know anything about him, to be honest. But if I was looked at him, I would... He obviously sprints, he practices running, probably does a lot of long distance, he probably does a lot of stretching as well, I'm sure he gets massages. He looks like he eats the right kind of food, drinks the right amount of water, takes vitamins. His whole day is so disciplined, for what? To prepare him for 9.57 seconds, I think that's what the world record is, right? 400 meters, 9.5 or 9.57 seconds. His whole day is preparing him for that short time, not the other way around. A lot of people say, you know what, I need to be more concentrated. So you know what, I'm gonna meditate in the morning, I'll sit down for two minutes. Okay, now I'm Zen master. <laughs> and the remaining 23 hours and 58 minutes, they just go about being ordinary and crazy. How does that work? How would you change? It's not balanced at all. So if for 23 hours and 58 minutes you were not being concentrated, you allowed your awareness to jump from one thing in your mind to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, to another thing in an uncontrolled way, what would you be good at? And out of con a, a prolonged concentration comes the wonderful power of observation. You just become more observant, and when you become more observant, you see solutions quicker and you solve things quicker. And it's a wonderful, powerful feeling 
when somebody is concentrated on you and not being distracted. So the best way is to integrate it into your everyday life. You're speaking with your spouse, give her or give him your undivided attention. So develop your awareness, integrate it into everything that you do in your life. And that's the best way you become good at. The next thing we need to develop is develop your will. Will is really important. Will is almost like a muscle in your mind and you use that to pull and control your awareness and take it from one area of the mind to another. What are the, and the will needs to be developed and same like concentration, if you don't cultivate the will, it doesn't grow. And this is something that really needs to be cultivated. How do you develop the will? There are three very simple ways to develop the will. One is you finish what you begin. Two is you finish it well beyond your expectation, no matter how long it takes. Three is you do a little bit more than you think you can do. All of those things require effort and effort is will. It's so much easier to start a project than to finish a project, right? When you start a project, you're feeling creative, you're feeling inspired, you're full of energy. At the end of the project, you go, whose idea was this? So it requires a tremendous amount of will to finish. And every time you complete something, you develop a little bit more will and you have that muscle. And will is an amazing thing to develop because once you develop will, that same will you can use in every aspect of your life to keep your awareness on one thing at a time, to finish projects, to see things through to the end, anything you want. The best way to develop will, bring it into your everyday life, into everything that you do. Give you an example, the way I integrate it into my everyday life, I try and finish what I begin. So for example, going to sleep. I sleep every night, so I put on my pajamas, I floss, I brush my teeth, I go to bed, I sleep, I wake up in the morning, I make the bed. Why? Because I'm finishing what I start. This idea and this notion that you could be anything you want, and you can accomplish anything you want, right? We hear that, you've heard that from the time you were little boys. You hear that now. You're already incredibly accomplished. You can win an NBA championship, MVP of the league. You could become president. You could become governor. You can have, you could be in, 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 in um, you could be in entertainment. You could do Charles, and you could do Shaq, you could do that. You could do whatever you wanna do. You guys know that. The thing that has worked for me is to remember the hard times. So, and I'm sure you guys all have your processes. And again, I'm going to tell you what's worked for me. So before a big movie comes out, before back in the days when I was wrestling with WWE, a WrestleMania match, anything big that would happen, I would always take a moment and I just remind myself, all right, I was evicted when I was 14. We were kicked off the island. We couldn't live in Hawaii. Had no place to live. Uh, a lot of shit happened then when I moved to Nashville. I was arrested multiple times by the time I was 16 years old. Like, I gotta remember that. Um, if I were playing on this team, uh, which my, you know, my skills are, um, what's that term? Oh, the shits. So, I would never play. But before I lace up, before I get on the court, before I play in these big games, before I go to the Staples Center, where history is there, those are, those are historic walls there at the Staples Center. Uh, I would remember that, and it allows me then to be present in the moment and understand, holy shit, this, the stuff I have around me right now, this is the shit that I dreamed of when I was a kid. I am here. And I played for University of Miami, played for great teams. Warren Sapp, Ray Lewis, they were my teammates. They were balling. Warren Sapp was playing tight end that time. I was starting defensive tackle. Yeah, they moved him over to D-line. And he looked at me, he's like, yo, dude, I'm gonna take your spot. And I said, you ain't taking my fucking spot. He said, I'm gonna take your spot. I said, no, you ain't. We battled and he took my spot. <laughs> like, you can imagine how that fucked with me because there goes my opportunity. He went in, switched the defensive tackle, lit the world on fire. But what that did, it crushed me, it crushed my dreams. I had a piss poor senior year, zero production, no NFL, no combine invite, nothing. Finally went to the CFL. Calgary Stampeders making $250 a week Canadian. Canadian. Now, I had to send that shit home to my, uh, to my wife at that time. I had no money. So I remember that. When I got cut from Canada, I had seven bucks in my pocket. And I always tell that story. So now my production company is seven bucks. 
advertising agency is seven bucks. Everything is seven bucks. So I always remember that. What helps me is to keep the hard times in the front of my mind because it allows me to go into these big moments that I've worked my ass off and you guys have worked your ass off. It allows me to go into these big moments with a different perspective. What it also does for me, and again, this just this is what works for me. Like, <clears throat> I keep my back exposed. And there's nowhere to go. But that way, that's it. So I feel like this could be something, an ideology and mindset that could help you, could, if you look at it that way. Because you made it already. We made it. We're successful boys and we're lucky boys to be where we're at. Oh, you guys made it. Everybody's rich in the room. Nobody's gonna get evicted anymore. Anything you got, there's no more money problems, right? You got a lot of hands out now. Hey, can I get a little bit? Can I get a little bit? Right, that happens. <clears throat> but when you make it, for me, I need this. I need this. So every day, my back is up against this motherfucker and this is how I operate. Now, doesn't mean you don't smile. Doesn't mean you don't laugh and joke, right? You're happy, I'm happy, I'm a happy guy. But when it comes to business and when it comes to executing, it's up against this. And I gotta go that way. And I don't give a fuck who is in front of me. They're not gonna stop me. I feel like for me, it feels seamless because you prepared for so long, but it's just like you guys prepping for a game. That's the fun part. That's where it's like, fuck, it's fun, man. People are paying their hard-earned dollars to come see you. They're cheering, they're going bananas, they're booing the shit out of you or on the road. It's, that's fun. That's what you live for. I mean, that's the juice right there. The prep is where the character's made. And I just don't mean the character I play, I mean the fucking, the character in here. So for me, the prep is getting with the director, getting with the producers, getting with the writers, getting with the, getting with, so in essence, it's like getting with all your coaches and your different uh, position coaches and, and all the, meetings that you have to have, right? So that's the work you put in. The key for me was, where does it start? What's the anchor? What's the anchor? So I could have all these ambitions and you guys have all these ambitions, which is great. It's important. I'll play this role, you'll play that role. I'll execute this thing and it'll come out this summer. You guys will execute this thing during the summer, right? When it's time to really put in a lot more work. But the key with me is just always finding what the anchor is. And the fucking anchor is getting up at four o'clock in the morning every day before anybody else and grounding my thought process is in the no one will outwork me. No one. So I just I want to show you some of the best body language hand gestures that you can use to help you become a more effective leader. Think about this one first, the triangle. Whenever I put my hands in the triangle, just like this, I'm gonna appear more intelligent and knowledgeable in what I have to say. So for example, today I wanna to talk to you about your body language and how you can become a better leader. Today I wanna to help you become a better leader and talk about your body language, right? Just by me putting my hands just like this in a triangle, I'm not changing my voice, I'm just putting my hands in a triangle. People also call this the steeple. I just make it more simple, call it the triangle. But here's the thing, what if you were on a date and your hands are in the triangle and you say, I want that lobster roll, I, I want that spaghetti. You might seem a little bit too, um, too overconfident, I will say. What you can do, think about the triangle, you can open it up a little bit more. You see, when you open up your hands as a leader, you appear a little bit more friendly, you're still super confident, but you are engaging your audience at the same time. And I'm sure that, now again, even though I'm standing up, you can do this in a, in a meeting, on a phone call, every single day with people. Don't think about this as who, oh, I just have to use this, let's say if I'm speaking in public. You, I'm sure you've seen this before, people are leaning back in their chairs and they're putting their hands in a triangle. So when you talk to people, right, think about how you are talking to them because visually, people will have a different perception of you in a matter of two or three seconds, okay? So think about the triangle. You can close it or you can open it up. This one again, they call this one the basketball steeple, okay? Think about the coach, la, 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 they're saying something, but their hands are a little bit more open and they're inviting. But at the same time, they're still super confident. If you want to, oh, one more thing. Have you noticed if I nod my head, 
you might want to nod as well. I am doing the same exact thing with my hands. So for example, I can say, today is how I'm just putting my hands up and down. Today, I want to talk to you about your body language and why it's so important for you to really learn about it a little bit more. So same thing. Visually, people will be a little bit more captivated because visually you'll be moving and it's towards them. If you want to appear more friendly, all you have to do is keep your palms facing up. So I can say, for example, hey, can you go to the grocery store today and we need some apples, bananas, and a bunch of strawberries. Now, this will be very different if I said, hey, can you go to the grocery store, we need some apples, bananas, and a bunch of strawberries. Your pointing is a little bit more direct, your open palms are a little bit more friendly. So if you are having a conversation with someone, right, someone will always say, hey, can you do this X, Y, and Z for me? But even if you open up your palms, hey, what do you think about this? From, hey, what do you think about this? Again, this is more direct, your point, this is a little bit more friendly. If you want to appear more assertive, all you have to do is cut. You can cut down, you can cut up, it's like you're gonna judo chop everywhere. Hey, can you go to the grocery store? We need some apples, bananas, and a bunch of strawberries. Today, I wanna to talk to you about your body language, your eyes, your arms, and everything in between, right? Look, if I cut my arms, I am just uh, asserting the words a little bit more confident, and it will make you a little bit more assertive. Here's the most important thing. You want to look at the flow of the movements. If you don't, I'm not saying you have to use this individually. If this feels very awkward for you, don't say, hey, I need this, 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 and this every single time. I just want you to try that out. But look at it this way. If I am more friendly, my arms or my body will flow a little bit more. If I want to be more assertive, my movements are more strict. I can still use the open palm and I can say, hey, can you, look, can you go to the grocery store, we need some apples, bananas, and a bunch of strawberries. My movements are still more strict, so if you want to appear, let's say, in a power position, you can stand up more rigid, your arms can move more strictly, and you will emphasize your words and whatever you say in a more confident but assertive way. If you want to appear a little bit more relaxed, your body will start to flow a little bit more, so it's more of a conversational tone. One last thing that I want to teach you guys. You see when I put my hands in a circle like this? It feels like I have an insight I just want to tell you about right now. It doesn't matter what it is. Today, my cat woke up and she did this one thing. Look, you just put your hands in a circle. And there's this one thing I just want to tell you about is this insight that you have. You see, people can have a perception of you just like that. But I so many people have asked me, do you ever get mad? And of course I answer, well, yes, everyone gets mad sometimes. The important thing is what we do with the mad that we feel in life. A few weeks ago on my way home from a particularly tough day at work, I stopped to see my two grandsons. Their mom and dad weren't there, but the boys were there with the babysitter in the backyard, squirting water with hoses. I could see that they were really having fun, but I felt I needed to let them know that I didn't want to be squirted, so I told them so. And little by little, I could feel that the older boy, Alexander, was testing the limit until finally his hose was squirting very close to where I was standing. I said to him in my harshest voice, okay, that's it, Alexander, turn off the water, you've had it. He did as I told him, said he was sorry, and looked very sad. The more I thought about it, the sadder I got. I realized that Alexander had not squirted me, and that I had stepped into his and his brother's play with a lot of feelings left over from work. So when I got home, I just called Alexander on the phone. I told him I felt awful about my visit with him. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was taking out my anger from work on him. I told him I was really sorry. Do you know how he answered me? He said, oh, Bubba, he calls me Bubba. 
Oh, Bubba, everybody makes mistakes sometimes. I nearly cried. I was so touched by his naturally generous heart. And I realized that if I hadn't called him, I might not have ever received that wonderful gift of Alexander's sweet forgiveness. <laughs>